I never got any money from you. UFO might just as well stand for unprecedented financial opportunity. Be normal. This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking today. We're looking at one of those intriguing 1970s encounters that kind of straddle the line between contact experience and abduction. It's the story of what happened to a guy out in Wyoming named Carl Higdon in 1974, as well as an examination of how this story was treated in the press and through the book that came out in 2017 that was authored by his wife, Marjorie. There's a couple different sources floating around here, and while they are largely consistent, there are some interesting wrinkles. This is a a fun sort of case. So this is one of those episodes, one of those stories where it, it, the, the most difficult and time-consuming aspect was trying to figure out in what order I should tell the story. Not that, not, that is to say, not in what order should I tell Higdon's story, but, but how should I proceed? Should I go through the whole narrative as presented in Alien Abduction of the Wyoming Hunter, first-person account of Carl Higdon, colon, October 25th, 1974, by Marjorie Higdon, published in 2017? Or should I go back to newspaper accounts that tell the story closer to the time period, throughout 1975 and, um, and, and earlier? Um, and it's, it's difficult because there are things in the newspaper reports that aren't in the book, and there are... Now, I'm not sure if there's anything in the book that isn't in the newspaper reports, uh, but it's it's a different sort of um, sort of approach. Being after the fact, being uh, being by the person involved, being more of a a long form thing. So, which do I uh, which do I tackle first? And I I was just about to get ready to record this by going through the 2017 book when I realized, you know, I, th- I think talking about the, the of the time, in the time um, accounts that came out more contemporaneously with the encounter uh, and then seeing how decades later it was remembered, reviewed, presented by, uh, by Carl and, and, and really by, by Carl's wife, um, that might be a better way to do it. So, so that is how I'm doing it. That is a a lengthy prologue that might end up being like a total five percent of the entire runtime of the episode is me explaining my thought process in putting this together. But uh, but but let's let's go ahead and get started with Carl Higdon's encounters. And because that was really just an extension of the introduction, I put our little segue noise in there, uh, in there once again. So the first or earliest newspaper discussion of this story I could find, or that I had access to via newspapers.com and such, was a March 1st, 1975 piece in a Tampa Bay newspaper by Dick Bothwell, which was mostly, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, um, it discusses, the Carl Higdon, uh, the Carl Higdon uh, account, but it's within the context of an interview with arch skeptic Phil Class, who was in Tampa to give a lecture. Now, at that point, on, on in the March first piece, uh, Bothwell refers to the Higdon case having been discussed in the March first issue of the National Observer. Now, I was a little bit confused about how. Um, a an article published on March 1st would refer back to an article published in another publication also on March 1st. But uh, I did some digging and was reminded that uh, the National Observer was a weekly newspaper published out of Washington, D.C. between 1962 
1977. And I, I knew I'd heard the, day, the, the name National Observer somewhere. And uh, it turns out that um, uh, Hunter S. Thompson had done uh, a, a lot of writing for the Observer uh, back in the 70s. And I had come across some of those articles in um, sort of compendiums of his writings. So Bothwell summarized Higdon's encounter this way, quote, it seems that Higdon was taking aim at five elk in a glade when he saw this man-sized figure with a slanted head bristling with stalks of wheat-like hair, no chin, and a skin-tight black suit with a wide belt. Some people might have thought it was a glitter rock star lost in the woods, but Higdon knew he was dealing with a spaceman when he found himself, black suit, and another black suit in a little cubicle along with the elk. He was taken to a huge tower in the sky and tested along with other earthlings, he says, but didn't pass and was returned to Earth, end quote. So, as, as we will see as we go on, yes, this first encounter that, that people reading this newspaper article would have of the, uh, the Higdon, the, Hig, the, the Carl Higdon experience, which would, it sounds like a, um, a, a great tribute band to some kind of glitter rock star, um, it, it does sound it's actually pretty close to what happened, but presented in a way that that seems dismissive, seems kind of silly. And this tone was continued when Phil Class gives his response to this case. Class shook his head regretfully. <sighs> That's the trouble. Americans are natural-born souvenir hunters. But do you realize that in all these cases we hear about, where people are aboard spaceships. Nobody ever thinks to pick up a ballpoint pen or an ashtray, anything, any artifact. It would only take one device made with a technology unknown on Earth to demonstrate for once and all that there are indeed extraterrestrial spaceships. The thing about Philip Class is that, you know, there's the bumper stickers, Class is a fink. And I think that was a classic sort of 70s, 80s UFO bumper sticker. Class comes across as he's he's a he's a mouthy, arrogant jerk. And my favorite story is him falling asleep at some UFO conference while somebody was trying to prove something um, about UFOs. And he just sort of dozes off. Um, but but I, I think class class is isn't was rather an an entertainer. He was just as much a. A, a f sort of self-aggrandizing figure of uh, self-conscious hatred among the UFO uh, field um, as as any other sort of celebrity skeptic or, um, or 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 ufologist for that that matter. Everybody's in the business of entertaining. Class would not get gigs doing lectures if he wasn't an entertaining speaker. And this point about you know. Why doesn't anybody pick up a ballpoint pen or an ashtray uh, or any artifact? Because Americans are natural-born souvenir hunters. I, I'd like to see the studies that uh, that demonstrate this. But you might say, "Well, that's you know that's um, that, that's just ridiculous." You know, it, it, it's 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 awful that he would have such a such a you know dismissive attitude and and such a bad faith argument against the reality of the flying saucers. But but this is no more a superficial dismissal of ufology than someone like Stan Friedman saying all it takes is one white bird to prove that all birds aren't black and and and, and it's a cosmic watergate and everybody has their kind of their kind of signature lines that they go to uh, but but there's there's a a gem from uh, Bothwell at the end about class and uh, I enjoyed this note my own secret observations have convinced me that Class is actually an extremely glib, smooth-tongued Martian sent to this planet to lull us all into a false sense of security. You read it here first. I, I really enjoy that because it's it's sort of – it comes across as kind of a dismissive news reporter sort of thing to say to, to sort of pile on the, the goofiness that – but there's – Describing class as glib and smooth-tongued, um, I, I think that's a that's a, an accurate uh, description of how class comes across in a lot of uh, the situations where 
people have found themselves looking to Philip Class for an opinion. Now, the March 16th, 1975 edition of the San Antonio Express included an insert, uh, which I assume was in there once a week or something, uh, the star, which looks like, exactly like, and I think it is, sort of a a slimmed down version of the, at this, that point, still very new star supermarket tabloid. And it was sort of inserted into papers, kind of like, I don't know if Parade Magazine is still around, but one of those inserts that would go into your local Sunday paper or your Saturday paper, or whatever the big weekend edition was. And it's it's sort of it's national news. But this is an extensive article by a reporter named Frank Burke that has the great headline, I was kidnapped by a UFO bubble. And the lead that kicks off the article makes an astounding assertion. A hunter's account of contact with beings from outer space and a kidnapped voyage aboard a craft from another planet was termed legitimate this week by a University of Wyoming psychologist. If you are familiar with the the ins and outs and the names of uh, ufology in the 1970s and 80s and onward, you've probably pegged the identity of that University of Wyoming psychologist. But the article starts off um, after that sort of shocking and and, and alarming um, declaration that this case is legitimate. Um, it, it starts off with with Carl Higdon himself explaining how the event has affected him before actually getting in to the details of the event itself. Life has not been the same since I met that man out in the woods. I wish the whole thing hadn't happened, but since it did, I think it's my duty to let folks know about it. People may talk behind my back, say I'm going crazy, but I swear I'm telling the truth. Like most UFO um, UFO uh, experiencers, um, the effect of telling the story, whatever the story actually ends up being about, but just telling your perceptions of, of what might have happened, um, makes you a target for um, abuse, mockery, things like that, suspicion, um, all sorts of things. So Higdon tells a story. He was out hunting elk in, uh, in Wyoming. And there was a, uh, a number of elk, five, standing in a glade. He has a rifle. He points the rifle at an elk. He fires. And then, this is very strange, he says the bullet leaves the rifle very slowly, almost like slow motion. And he says, quote, in addition, the projectile dropped into the snow only 50 feet away. I thought to myself, what can be going on? Well, this is what was going on. Immediately, I sensed a peculiar tingle in the air like you often feel before an electrical storm. Turning quickly, I spotted a stranger standing behind me in the shadows. At first, I thought he was just another hunter until my eyes became accustomed to the glare of the bright sunlight on the freshly fallen snow. The stranger glided noiselessly toward me. If he had been human, I would certainly have heard his footsteps on the dried twigs and branches which covered the snow. Standing all of six foot two, he was dressed in a snug-fitting black jumpsuit, which covered him from the region of the neck to his toes. Around his midsection, he wore a wide belt, in the center of which was a six-pointed star and a mysterious emblem. He had coarse hair that stood straight up like bristles on a broom. They were spaced about half inch apart, sticking out from the top of his head were two antenna-like rods. His face was eerie because he had no chin. His head ran straight into his neck. His eyes were unusually small, and he had no eyebrows. And while I was in his company for several hours, at no time during this period did I ever see his hands if he had them. The sleeves of his one-piece garment were long, and in place of hands, he seemed to have two tapered rod-like appendages, which he would point in order to make things move. It was as if he could control the force of gravity with these objects. The possibility arises that they may have been part of his body. The man, the strange man with the protruding objects instead of hands and the uh, chinless face sort of stands there a few feet from Higdon. And then he asks if Higdon is, is hungry and tosses him a small envelope containing four pills. 
And Higdon says, quote, I took them, although normally I don't like to take even an aspirin when I know it's I'm coming down with a cold. It's like I was being controlled, made to take them. There's some discussion of the hypnosis conducted by Leo Sprinkle, which brings out some more details, which we'll see in a bit from another later article. And the uh, the writer in the star actually, uh, in, in conclusion, connects Higdon's account, Higdon's experience and explanation of what happened to him with another major sort of paranormalish mystery of the time. While under hypnosis, Higdon revealed that others besides him have previously been contacted. Higdon even recalled seeing other Earth people while he was on the alien's planet. When asked why the space beings were traveling over light years to reach the Earth, Higdon said that he was told that they needed wild game and fish to use as food. Such a statement may offer, at long last, a solution for the disappearance of cattle and other livestock recently being reported across the United States. So as you'll recall, the 70s were a period where the cattle mutilation phenomenon gets going. There's there's missing cattle. There's the uh, the abduction of Myra Hansen, I think, who um, who is is abducted and sees livestock on the ship where she is. And that that story was first sort of revealed to the public in in the weekly world news. And this is maybe a good time to uh to sort of reveal as we did back in our our weekly world news episode i believe that um the the tabloids of the time um, they they weren't credible in the sense that the the major traditional broadsheet newspapers were credible but they weren't possibly weren't as viewed weren't viewed as dimly as they might be in the 80s 90s uh, into the 21st century. So UFO organizations like APRO, which did look at uh, at Carl Higdon's case, um, organizations like APRO would sell stories to the tabloids as a source of income and to get the stories out there more widely. So when we see some reasonably interesting, straightforward coverage in something like The Star – it it shouldn't um it shouldn't automatically make us dismiss what was reported now later in the year in november of 1975 the uh, november uh, 6th edition of the casper wyoming star tribune so a relatively local paper um has a story with the headline ufo expert hypnotizes man to learn more of alleged trip and it describes that uh, ufo expert dr leo sprinkle hypnotized a Rollins, Wyoming man to learn more details of that man's alleged encounter journey with strange creatures bound for their home some 163,000 miles away. So it goes a little bit, this story goes a little bit more into what Carl experienced on the ship. They say that um, he was taken up into uh, into a a device that looked like a the tall tower wrote that resembled the rotating restaurant at the Seattle World's Fair. They strapped a helmet on him, and the helmet had six wires coming out of it. And they told Higdon that they were going home. And at this point, he perceives that he is at the tower that's like the one at the World's Fair, and he is complaining of the intense light. The, the light is, is, is hurting him, harming him. And they agreed to take him, uh, take him home. And the next thing Carl remembers, he says, is that he was talking to his employer on the radio of the uh, pickup truck he drove out to go hunting. And the truck was three miles away from where he recalled uh, parking it. And then it goes into Leo Sprinkle's background. He's the director of the counseling and testing department at University of Wyoming, he reported that Higdon was, quote, dazed and found speaking difficult when searchers found him and was transported to Carbon County Memorial Hospital, where he was observed for two days. And then, and then Sprinkle sort of puts Higdon's um, encounter in the context of other UFO encounters that he's familiar with. Uh, Sprinkle says, quote, although the sighting of a single UFO witness often is difficult to evaluate, the indirect evidence supports the tentative conclusion 
that Carl Higdon is reporting sincerely the events which he experienced. Hopefully, further statements from other persons can be obtained to support the basic statement. Now, that is a very carefully phrased sort of thing. Evidence supports the ten- indirect evidence supports, not verifies, supports the tentative conclusion that he's reporting sincerely the events which he experienced. There's a lot of sort of get out of argument free uh, cards in that sentence, uh, which is which is appropriate. That's a, a, a proper way to phrase that. Um, at the end of the day, what we can tell is that Carl believes that what he is telling you is what he experienced. We're not making any conclusions about what he might have experienced, about the reality of it, about how his perceptions tally with whatever actually happened to him. Uh, but it's it's a, it's an interesting and and very careful way to phrase that. So this is this is an interesting sort of sort of case just from these uh, these initial accounts, because like many of these sort of strange early abductions in the in the sixties and seventies, this has just as much in common with a a with the nuts and bolts of a contactee encounter as it does with the later abductee reports. There's the sort of experimentation aspect from the abductions. There's the uh, really sort of non-consensual taking of a person as in an abduction. But these are, are humanoid figures with strange features that don't really fit into the what will become the, the widely accepted gray interpretation gray alien interpretation of things. So I love these these sort of 70s things. This is a humanoid encounter. This is a, um, I don't know, proto-abduction encounter. It's You've got the hypnosis, which was becoming a sort of standard procedure, more standard procedure in the 1970s. Um, I've said this before. I will continue to say it. The 70s uh, have never gotten their due as a, a golden age of uh, of ufo weirdness carl's story was also featured in what i consider the the gold standard of um journalistic coverage of bizarre paranormal strange encounters in the 1970s i am of course speaking of in search of presented by leonard nimoy i think a lot of us um got our first taste or one of our first tastes of in, an incredible array of, of paranormal topics from endless reruns of In Search Of, at least those of us of a certain age. I was I was too young to pay attention to it when it was first broadcast, but I think I've mentioned this before. Um, our local uh, independent station, uh, Channel 55 out of Fort Wayne, would usually like show several In Search Of episodes whenever, uh, whenever a Cubs game uh, you know, ran short and they had some space to fill before their next uh, their next block of programming. So this episode of In Search of uh, Higdon's story comprises about half of the episode about UFO abductions and uh, and such like. And it does a good job of of giving us an idea of who Carl is, his personality uh, and and the steps he went through and the process he went through to arrive at if not an understanding of what happened to him, then at least a um, a, a place where he could somehow uh, somehow cope with it. So it's uh, it's an interesting story. We're going to go through some clips here and sort of just track how it presents his story because that's kind of our focus here to sort of remind us all of what our focus here is today to, to sort of track how the story is taught from those initial newspaper reports through his wife's book about it in 2017. So uh, who is Carl Higdon? What did he do? What kind of person was he? Carl Higdon is the foreman of an oil rig in Rawlins, Wyoming. He's been at the same job for 15 years, working six days a week to support a family of seven. His crew refers to him as the Wyoming Coyote because of his feisty determination to get the job done against all odds. Literally everybody has a cool nickname except me. That's how I feel sometimes. Nobody's ever going to call me anything as cool as the Wyoming Coyote. So this presents Carl as hardworking, 
down to earth guy that is loved and respected by those around him. But then something happens to Carl. I went to pick up my crew to go to work, and one of them was sick, so we couldn't work. So I came back to the house and decided I'd go hunting. So I decided to go on down into the forest, and I hunted down there until, oh, it must have been around 4 o'clock. So I walked down over this hill. Whenever I got over the hill, I seen these five elk standing down there. One of them was a big bull, so I raised my gun to shoot. Then, something happened beyond his range of experience. Now, from the newspaper accounts, particularly the account in The Star, the the next thing that happens is, is, is Carl fires at the elk, and then the bullet comes out in slow motion. But the account here doesn't really bring that up yet. Carl blacked out. When he regained consciousness... He was aware that an undetermined period of time had elapsed and that he had lost touch with reality. He stumbled through the forest in a dazed condition, trying desperately to figure out where he was and how he could get help. So that's a little different. This this telling that supposedly is straight from Carl's conscious recollection kind of skips over some of the, the things that, that we have heard before. So while he is out wandering the woods, we get our first encounter with Marjorie, his wife, who will loom large later in the episode. By eight in the evening, Marjorie Higdon became alarmed when her husband hadn't returned. She called for a search party. Hello, Marilyn. Yes, this is Margie. Um... Carl's not in from hunting yet, and I was wondering if you guys could take me out and look for him. Yeah, I know, but he's not in yet. Yeah, but I don't have a four-wheel drive. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I don't know. I just feel like I ought to go look for him. One of the things I've always loved about In Search Of is is the way they, they take the actual people involved in the story when possible and have them do their own, uh, their own re recreations of what happened. I I think that's, that's a nice touch. So Marjorie is looking for Carl. She's worried. She can't get out in the woods. She doesn't have a four wheel drive. These are practical, realistic concerns, Uh, but she finds some people, they get a posse together and everything will soon be progressing. Carl's friends discovered him in a semi-conscious state. They were disturbed by his incoherent ramblings. What happened? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. It seems strange. You sure you're all right? Uh, Yeah. You're not hurting anywhere? No. Okay. Get you out of here and get you to the doctor as soon as we can. Carl was rushed to the emergency ward of the Carbon County Hospital, where he had trouble seeing, hearing, and speaking. Nurse Ella Peterson attended him for three days. During that time, he remained mainly in an amnesiac state, unable to recall his own name or recognize his wife. After the incident, life in Rawlins changed for Carl. He was too disoriented to work or function normally. So this kind of kind of uh, connects to what he said in that Star article that that life has become more difficult, more challenging for him since this. And when you have these sorts of issues, one of the things many people might do is contact a UFO investigator. In desperation, he contacted the UFO agency APRO, who sent Dr. Leo Sprinkle to investigate. Uh, I serve as a consultant in psychology. And my primary interest is working with those people who uh, claim to not only see uh, flying saucers, but also claim to have had some kind of abduction experience or some kind of contact, uh, face-to-face contact with uh, alien beings who are associated with the, uh, with the UFOs. So Higdon is connected with Leo Sprinkle, 
and undergoes some hypnosis where more details of his encounter are revealed. Bullet don't. Don't look right. There's somebody. Strange. He wants me to go with him. Lights are bright. Lights are... I can't... can't keep my eyes open. I can't see. So here we get the strangeness with the bullet and the bright lights that were mentioned in the... Um, in the uh, the newspaper reports and the 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 order of events here makes it clear that these are details that were uh were retrieved via hypnosis the other stories sort of blur the lines of of the exact order in which these things occurred um i like hearing from the experiencers in their own voices i think that is really great i do wish that um, they would have had like recordings of the actual hypnosis instead of the the in search of recreation of the hypnosis. I think it's not unreasonable to uh, to believe or to expect that there might be some uh, you know sort of sweetening of the story through that uh, through that means. Nevertheless, it's what we have, and his hypnosis would reveal even more interesting information. Look like me, same features. He said, "The sun burns him. He's gonna take me, take me back." Just let yourself go back inside the cubicle. What happens inside the cubicle? Oh. Can't get in, there ain't no door. Do you know how you get in? No. We're above the trees. I can see pretty good. The ball looks like a basketball. But it's got a blue, gray outline. So this is absolutely uh, sort of a a strange kind of um, kind of kind of encounter here. And at Leo Sprinkle, um, after the hypnosis segments are shown, talks about how he is is diligent in trying to corroborate every aspect of the witness's story and to verify. The witness's uh, credibility. So much like much like the show did by starting off by uh, explaining that he's the Wyoming Coyote and his men love him and he's a hardworking guy, just t- just trying to take care of his family like any uh, like any decent American man in 1974 would. Uh, so we we get some some discussion with with some people that uh, that were part of this encounter who were witnesses to what went on, such as the nurse at the Carbon County Hospital. He uh, kept his eyes closed most of the time, saying that they hurt quite a bit. It's, uh, it's, it's clear to me that uh, with that nurse's testimony, we can close the book on the Carl Higdon case. It was obviously true. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. So uh, Sprinkle also facilitated a lie detector test to determine whether or not there was any deception uh, on the part of of Carl and the the episode of in search of does sort of you know recreate a few questions from the lie detector test but doesn't doesn't do a sort of sort of you know Maury Povich show rundown of each question and whether or not um, Higdon was was deceptive or telling the truth but but in his sort of summary of the phenomenon in general, uh, Sprinkle also doesn't necessarily address Higdon's uh, case specifically, but you can sort of see where he's coming from. 
In my own personal opinion, uh, I find uh, with the cases I've investigated that uh, there seems to be no evidence of uh, hoax. Uh, there seems to be no evidence uh, of a psychotic reaction which has caused the individual to uh, falsely believe that he or she has had an abduction. So that uh, I'm left with the uh, mysterious and sometimes uncomfortable feeling that the uh, cases are happening uh, as the individuals described. That is, that they are being taken on board, examined, and released by intelligent beings uh, who, for their own reasons, uh, are engaging in these experiences. Now, I'll be honest. To me, this seems like kind of a leap, that we are jumping from this person does not seem to be actively lying about what they experienced to we are taking everything they said about what they experienced at absolute face value. I think there is a a huge chasm there between what they perceived and what might be some kind of objective reality. And, um, and, and, and this is, this is a recurring, a recurring thing, right? This person is credible. Therefore, anything they say is also credible. Um, that's not, that's not the case. I'm not saying somebody like Higdon is being deceptive. I'm just saying, you know, there's, a chance they might be mistaken. Now, what, one of the things that I like about how this uh, this episode of In Search of's treatment of Carl Higdon wraps up is, is that we we see Higdon arrive at some sort of peace with his situation. Carl managed to work through a traumatic incident that he had been unable to live with, with the help of Doctor Sprinkle. He no longer was haunted by nightmares. He no longer doubted his own sanity. The abduction experience was resolved to his own satisfaction, and Call resumed his work with a new vigor. Don't make a hill of beans to me whether anybody believes it or not. Uh, I know what happened to me. If people want to take it at face value, that's fine. If they don't, it don't make any difference. The only thing I'm saying is if this does happen to anybody else what they are to do is talk to somebody about it not to hold it inside and try to conquer it themselves because it can't be done i don't think i don't think our mind can take it uh, as far as the uh, experience happening to me uh, i think if it hadn't been for dr sprinkle i probably would have been in the institution by now this is one of those situations where i'm i'm glad that someone like Carl got to a point in his life where he was able to, um, to, to, to cope with the experiences well, to, to come to terms with them and, 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 and have that, that peace, I guess. I, I wonder how much better or worse things might have turned out if he had received counseling, help, therapy, from someone who didn't come at this from a UFO point of view, but rather from a helping somebody overcome trauma, strange experiences, sort of UFO viewpoint agnostic kind of category. That is in, isn't even a real sentence. Um, don't try to diagram that. But it, it's it's interesting because he, on the other hand, he's – He's working for a, a, a well digging company in Wyoming in 1974. This isn't a guy who's who's probably just going by the demographics and mindset of the time. And even now, um, we want you to see a psychiatrist because of the story you're telling. That would probably not have gotten as far as we would like you to talk to these people who are experts in the sort of strange experience you had. Um it's it's difficult to get people to seek help for some things. And maybe, maybe talking to Apro and Dr. Sprinkle was better than not talking to anybody. Uh, Carl certainly seems to have that opinion. So Carl's story would appear in, in many compilations of books about about abductions and uh, and humanoid sightings. Um, there's one uh, from a 2006 book by uh, a, a being called Nahu, called UFOs, God from Inner Space, that examines uh, Higdon's experiences in terms of 
uh, of, of Kundalini energy and other things that I'm not familiar with enough to uh, discuss. But there is a, an interesting connection that John Keel um, discussed in his book, The Cosmic Question, with regard to one aspect of Carl's experience. In other cases, the contactees have been handed strange cigarettes or cups of an oily liquid. I call this the ambrosia factor. It can be traced back to the days of Greece and Rome, when those who were privileged to have a meeting with the gods on Mount Olympus were offered cups of the magical cure-all said to render the drinker immortal. Since no one has ever run across a 3,000-year-old man, we can assume that Ambrosia's only effect was to make the drinker high enough to commune with the gods, just as Higdon's pill probably conditioned him for his time-bending adventure in the UFO tower. I think this is a nice a nice connection, and it, it puts me in mind of the, the pills in general. Put me in mind of uh, of Orfeo Angelucci with the the pills dropped in the ginger ale like substance that that set him off on this uh, on on his uh, trip in many senses of the word that he took. So this is this is sort of a rundown of of how from you know. Right near the, uh, the the sort of first publication of these encounters through um, through Keel and and in search of how Higdon's story was uh, was told. After the break, we're going to look at the 2017 account that was published by Higdon's wife Marjorie and see how that's different. How it how it has a different effect on the reader. What's there? What's missing? What's added um like many of our episodes this is sort of it sort of straddles the line between here's an interesting ufo story and here's something interesting about the nature of how different people tell the same story but we're going to look at that after the break if you like the saucer life and want more you can support us in exchange for bonus content Patrons get the episodes before everybody else. There's bonus content every month. Um, it's a nice group of people, nice nice community there. And if you're interested, you can check it out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or via the link in the show notes. And you can check out past episodes uh, at saucerlife.com or your favorite podcast app. Um, we're on Instagram. We're on uh, Facebook. Just search Saucer the Saucer Life. You'll get to it. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, but... Um, I hate it, so I'm not really there much beyond automated, uh, automated posts or occasionally there's something interesting. Uh, you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. Uh, you can also contact us by post at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, uh, 48480. So we had, uh, we had some feedback from our previous episode about the Alan Godfrey uh, Alan Godfrey's experience, um, and uh, I have a few of those here for you. Um, Flying Lemon uh, responded that, uh, uh, as someone who is deeply skeptical of hypnotic regression, I love seeing an encounter story where the subject has a more nuanced take about it. Also interested in the fact that even though he didn't outright describe the authorities visiting him as men in black proper, he described them as having unsettling qualities. Yes, I agree. There, There was something eerie about the uh, the men from the ministry and somebody else on social media or in a comment somewhere uh, did point out that that phrase the man from the ministry was was sort of current in British pop culture uh, at the time so just call me the man from the ministry and his little smile that's that's kind of it, it's as close to a joke as uh, as they probably God. Um, longtime correspondent Lester says, thanks for this episode. I admit laughable stories about the Schmidt and Ahos and cars give me much pleasure, but the odd experiences of level-headed people are what it's all about. I still wonder what kind of visa Orthon or Valiant Thor had. Well, Valiant Thor, I am sure, had, um, had some kind of diplomatic passport uh, that the State Department was like, okay, um, this, is, uh, this is an official visit from a technically foreign power, so we will treat it much like a uh, a, a diplomatic passport sort of thing. Orthon uh, Orthon strikes me as the kind of guy who would have had a uh, a sheet of paper 
that had passport written on it, uh, like in crayon or something, uh, sort of like a, a sovereign citizen license plate. If you've seen those uh, circulating on um, on the internet, I, I just think Orthon would have would have come up with something kind of kind of homespun and goofy like that. Uh, Laura comments that uh, Alan Godfrey reminds uh, me a lot of Lonnie Zamora. But it's interesting to see the difference in the direction the story went after 15 years of UFO investigations, post Condon, and in the early abduction days. You can clearly see how the narrative evolved over time. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think that's that's very true. Both police officers both have this this strange uh, this strange encounter. Uh, but uh, but the aftermath is uh, is a bit different for each. And um, to go back to uh, to flying lemons point, I didn't really really think about the fact that I would that I am at this point doing two hypnosis based episodes back to back. I didn't really think about that. Mostly, um, I uh, I was intrigued by the Higdon story because of the book we're going to look at here in a second, and uh, pushed back some other topics to get to this. But this does mean two hypnotic regression stories in a row, and we should probably get back to that story. So let's look at this book. Um, It's called, as I mentioned, The Alien Abduction, no, sorry, no, The Alien Abduction of the Wyoming Hunter, First Person Account of Carl Higdon, October 25th, 1974. So it's, it's got a very descriptive title. And it's written by Marjorie Higdon. And you might notice that, uh, yes, this is a first person account written by somebody else. So that's, that's one thing about it. It's, uh, it's published through, uh, through create space, I believe on, uh, on Amazon first published in, uh, in late 2011. Um, it's, It's not a long book. It's 75 pages, sort of trade paperback sized. It's thin enough that uh, the title of the book does not appear on the spine uh, because there's no room for it. The print is probably 12 point. The line spacing is about a line and a half, so not quite uh, quite double spaced, but close. There's uh, several points at which things just are sort of individual sentences centered on the page with spacing between them. It's not a, uh, it's not a dense book. It's not a, a tightly packed book. Um, the writing style I would describe as it. I think, I hope this comes across when we hear some, some excerpts, there's bits of it that are really good and evocative, but the way it's all put together is, is, kind of un, uh, unskilled, inexperienced, amateurish, which, I mean, that's fine. That's what it is. Uh, just for a taste, this is, the, um, this is the, the back cover. The first person story of Carl Higdon, The Wyoming Hunter's Alien Abduction, October 25, 1974, written by his wife. The bullet he watched come out of his new 7mm mag rifle hit something, turned inside out, and fell to the ground, was found devoid of any lead. The story of his abduction is still on the internet, after 43 years. How did his pickup get in the muck hole? Hypnosis, lie detectors, various testings. What happened to the bullet? Lie detector tests. Hypnosis and tests. Read what happened after. (laughs) So... It's that it gives you a taste, right? It gives you a taste of what kind of uh, what kind of prose we're dealing with here. Now the book begins with uh, on October twenty fifth, nineteen seventy four. He's going on his uh, his elk hunting trip. Carl is, and uh, Carl was at the fork in the road leading to the McCarty Canyon when he inf- encountered some fellow hunters. They were working on their pickup. It had stalled, and they couldn't get it to start. You know, it starts off with with things that we haven't really heard before. Carl's hunt, talking with the hunters. They tell him to go to the forest near Medicine Bow National Park rather than McCarty Canyon. So they say, hey, Carl, you're going hunting? Let me tell you. 
the hunting is way better in the forest than it is in the canyon. And once this juncture point where Carl decides on the scope of his hunting and the course of his day is there, we get sort of centered on the page in bold print this. Was this day planned or was it circumstantial? Carl had planned to go hunting in the canyon, and the hunters suggested that he go hunting in the forest. It was a beautiful autumn day as Carl drove into the forest. He parked his pickup upon a knoll and poured a cup of coffee. He got out and stood in front of his pickup to survey the area, when the game warden drove up. Carl and the game warden discussed hunting in the area and shot the breeze over coffee. Carl told the game warden he thought he would go down the hill and see if he could find anything never suspecting what he was about to find. So what was he about to find? Well, it's five elk. And he fires at them with his new 7mm mag rifle. That's how the gun is always uh, always described in italics, new 7mm mag rifle. Um, so he pulls it out. He sights a deer. He pulls the trigger, and what happens? But the shot makes no noise. He watches the 7mm mag bullet as it comes out of the rifle barrel, goes out a few feet, stops in midair, and falls to the ground, all in slow motion. He watched the bullet come out of the rifle. How can this be? A 7mm travels over 3,600 feet a second, and he watched it come out of the rifle, go a few feet, and fall to the ground. The elk are still there. There was no noise to scare them. They stand motionless. There is no noise. The birds are even silent. Everything is totally silent. What is going on? So, it's it's interesting. I, and this book is what hooked me on this story. I, I sort of read this book before I read all of the other uh, newspaper stories or, or watch the In Search of clip. And and this is, at first I was irritated and was like, oh, this is a very poorly written book. And then when I started saying the things out loud, suddenly it became a better book. It's more like there are bits of the book that make good sort of stream of consciousness ramblings when you hear them auditorially or audibly, not auditoriably, audibly. But when you read it like a book, it doesn't work as well, if that makes sense. So Carl's had the mystery bullet go out. He goes over to where the bullet dropped to the ground. He picks it up, puts it in his canteen pouch. But then something else happens. He sensed something behind him. He turned around. There's someone there. It is a man. But he looked different from any man Carl had ever seen. The man was about six feet tall. He had straw-colored hair that stood straight up. He had two strands of hair in the front that looked like antennas. His face seemed to go back into his neck like he had no chin. His face was yellowish. He was dressed in a black suit, kind of what a scuba diver would wear. His legs were bowed. The man asked Carl, Are you hungry? Carl replied, A little. A packet of pills floats over to Carl. The man tells Carl to take one. Carl does as he says, but he doesn't know why. He seldom ever takes even aspirin. He doesn't like to take pills. He doesn't know why he took the pill. It was as if he had no willpower. Now, this is interesting compared to the initial accounts. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that there's no indication that this is something that only is known to Carl after he has hypnosis. It's it just presented as part of his recollection, although it's not really completely clear in the book exactly when and how things are happening. So maybe these memories were recovered via hypnosis and they're just explaining that later. It's, it is a, a troublingly uh, written book sometimes, but I think it's interesting that earlier accounts, the, uh, the creature or the being or the, 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 the spaceman tossed the packet of pills to Carl, but here it's a more supernatural. 
the pills, the packet of pills floated across to him like it's sort of mental control or something like that. So where does Carl go? Well, there's all sorts of talk about it in, in the newspaper articles about a booth, a cubicle, something like that. This is how Carl describes it in the book. The next thing I know, I am inside a glass cubicle. I will call it that, for I know of no other words to describe it. I am sitting in a high back seat, like a bucket seat. My arms are strapped down. Something is on my head. I can't move. I can't turn around, but I sense the five elk behind me. They are reflected in the glass overhead like a mirror. They're in a cage. They are motionless. The next thing I see is my pickup. I am looking down at my pickup sitting on the hill. This being waves his hand, and my pickup disappears. Next, I look down and see a blue ball. It looks like a huge marble. Then everything black. Then light. Bright light. Higdon can't keep his eyes open because of the bright light, and his eyes start to water. And the light, it's coming from a tower. And he says it's like the Space Needle at the World's Fair. So that connection from the newspaper articles is there. Uh, but he's, he's blinded by this light. But at the base of the tower are people. He says, people like me. They seem to be at ease, he says, and talking amongst themselves. Then two of them float to him and take him down a walkway. And, and they don't walk. They float. And he's in a large room. A wall comes down and he says it seems to be some kind of examination. And then this, this, is, this is how it's written. They say, quote, I am not what they want. They will take me back, end quote. What I think he should have typed and I think the meaning is they say, quote, you are not what we want. We will take you back. I, I think he just shifted. He – yeah, you you get it. But it was confusing to me at first. But he doesn't really meet whatever requirements they're looking for. So he is going back. We are then back outside. Again, we do not walk. We float. We are now again back in the lights. Oh, the lights. The lights. They are so bright. The light burns my eyes. It's unlike any feeling I've ever had. My eyes keep watering. It's, it's hard for me to see. We are now inside the craft. This time, there is only one being. He says his name is Auzo One. He will take me back. I am not what they want. Auzo One tells me they have been coming to Earth for many years. They come in search of fish and animals. Their food is in the form of pills. One pill will last for three days. They make the pills from fish and animals. Their ocean is yellow. All the fish have died. He shows me a landmass map of his planet. He tells me we are 163,000 light years from Earth. The, the nine planets of our solar system supply the magnetic force for our power. He takes my rifle. He studies it. He said he would like to keep it. It is a primitive weapon, but he is not allowed to. Primitive? I just bought it. He tells me that they wear black because our sun burns them. The patches are symbols of their planet. He said he is a hunter. So Auzo or Auzo, it's uh, A-U-Z-Z-O and then the word one spelled out. So Auzo one. So Auzo one and Carl are in the air. They're over the forest and they begin to float down out of the spaceship and they sort of touch down on the side of a hill. His foot slips, he falls, and he bangs his shoulder. And he doesn't know where he is. He, he sees a sign, North Boundary, Lincoln Forest, but he says, where is that? He doesn't know where he is. It's getting dark. He's cold. He finds a truck, and at the time, he, he's sort of addled in the head, doesn't know it's, if it's his or not. He figures out how to use the radio, and he talks to the person on the other end, who we know is his employer. The voice on the radio wants to know where, where he is and, and who is this calling. But that's a difficult question.
I don't know. Who am I? Where am I? I tell this person that I saw a sign that read North Boundary, Lincoln Forest, but I don't know where that is. I'm sitting in a pickup with a funny stick in the middle. I I don't know what it's for. The person on the radio tells me, look in the glove compartment for some papers. Take the papers out, then read out loud what is on the papers. He keeps talking to me and asking, who are you? Where are you? I keep telling him, I don't know. I don't know. I am so cold. Where are my elk? My elk. Where are my elk? My, my pickup. My, my pickup just disappeared. The, the big blue ball. The men in black. I'm so cold. I keep saying, I don't know. I don't know. I'm so cold. So cold. Do you see what I mean? When I was reading that, recording that, that sort of excerpt there, it felt way more chilling and, and visceral than it did when I was reading this sort of all going at, at, at one time. Now, when he mentions the men in black, he's referring to the black tight-fitting jumpsuits that the, uh, the space tower people are wearing. They have to wear black suits because that protects them from being burned up by our sun for some reason. So at this point, the story shifts to Marjorie, who comes home from work. And as we heard on uh, from um, In Search Of, she's concerned that Carl is not back. And so she starts asking around for help. A search party is formed. Um, guys with four-wheel drive vehicles, because she doesn't have one. Um, they're experienced hunters. They know the territory. And then they find Carl. And he's in his pickup truck, and it's a strange scene. Marjorie ran over to the pickup where Carl was. She was so happy to see him, but he seemed different. She tried to talk to him. He just looked at her as though he was looking through her. Finally, she asked him if he got his elk. He looked dazed. He looked up through the windshield, and in a sing-song voice, he said, They took my elk. They took my elk. They took my elk. Carl was shivering. He was so cold. Marjorie took off her coat and tried to drape it over his shoulders. He moved back, crying, Don't touch me! Don't touch me! Marjorie was scared. She's not sure what's wrong with her husband. So that's... that. that I mean, if, if you imagine yourself in that... In that kind of situation, that's very, uh, very troubling. And she, she tells Don, who's one of the search party, to take, uh, take Carl's rifle out of the truck because she doesn't know what's wrong with him. But clearly, something is. And he just kept repeating, look, sort of staring through the windshield and just saying, they took my elk. They took my elk. It, which is very, very, um, very strange. So they, they head to the... Um, they, they go to the hospital trying to get him some care. Along the way, they, uh, they meet up with another guy, uh, Roy Fleming, who, w- who joined the search party. And they're sort of there, not to the hospital yet, but they're sort of there along the road. Roy gets out of his car and um, he, they're going to put Carl in, in Roy's car to take him to the hospital. Roy got out of his car, went around, and opened the back door to let Carl in, when all hell broke loose. Carl bolts and runs from Bud's pickup. The deputy sheriff runs to the side of the ditch. He crouches down with his gun drawn and steadied on his knee, ready to shoot if needed. Carl is not acting like himself. No one knows what he might do. Carl is running with his arms over his eyes. He's running and screaming, the lights, oh God, the lights. Marjorie realizes that it's the car headlights that are probably bothering him. So she gets everybody to turn their, uh, their headlights off and, um, they get everything calmed down. They get, uh, they get, uh, Carl in Roy's car and Carl asks some questions. Carl is sitting in the front seat of Roy's car and talks with him. He wants to know why Roy isn't dressed in black. 
doesn't the sun burn you, he asked. Carl talked about his 163,000 light mile trip into outer space. Carl talked of a lot of things about this trip that to this day, Roy does not want to talk about. That sounds so ominous that I, it really makes me want to know more. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like a, a sort of forced bit of artificial artificial drama or suspense. It, it, it actually, to me, feels very down to earth. So Carl gets to the hospital. He's examined by the doctors. They decide to, to give him a chance to, to rest and hopefully figure out more about what might have happened to him. In the meantime, Marjorie, when taking care of all of his stuff, finds the weird remains of that uh, of that uh, bullet that was fired from the new seven millimeter mag hunting rifle, and she takes it to the sheriff's office to um, to try to get some answers about what it might be. In a few minutes, he came back with the piece of metal. He handed it back to Marjorie and verified, it is a 7mm mag shell. Marjorie asked, how did it get into this shape? The deputy replied, just leave it alone. It was a weird night. Just leave it alone. Again, a little bit of suspense, a little bit of weirdness, but nothing nothing that seems cheap or... um, Anything out of the ordinary, really. I can, I can imagine a frustrated sheriff's deputy just saying, just, just leave it alone. Crazy night. I don't know why the shell casing is all weird, but just leave it alone. So in the hospital, Carl's memory does come back when his oldest daughter, Rose, uh, comes to visit him. Uh, that's sort of the trigger that helps him recover the rest of his memory. And at that point, the doctor realized there's really nothing physically wrong with him and so uh and so let him go and at that point the local newspaper reported on carl's story and carl's experience i could not i do not have access to the newspaper in rollins so unfortunately i don't uh, i don't have that but um the story starts to get out and then carl's friend roy uh, who he was in the car with asked him if he wanted to talk to a counselor named uh, named Rick. And Rick is very interested in, quote, these types of cases. Uh, Carl says that's, uh, that's fine. And uh, they start talking together. And then Rick asks if Carl would mind meeting with Dr. Leo Sprinkle from the University of Wyoming. In the meantime, things were trying to get back to normal. But for Carl, they they were not getting back to normal. He was concerned. He was a little worried about his own sanity. He did not feel comfortable going back to work because he didn't want his judgment to be impaired in a way that could lead to an accident or an injury for a member of his uh, of his crew. So he's very much, you know, down. He's he's very much not getting back to whatever was normal beforehand. And the In Search of episode sort of made it sound a little bit like, you know, this UFO guy couldn't get a job. But no, it wasn't It wasn't like that. It was, it was more um, he just didn't feel comfortable being out there doing what he had been doing before. And so he feels like he has to meet with somebody like, like his counselor Rick or Dr. Sprinkle to try to get some answers out of um, out of this out of this whole experience and in the in the hypnosis sessions we basically get his story as he related at the beginning of the book it just sort of is the background to how we get the full the full story we do however um get a a better um a better sort of more thorough description of the uh, of the creature He was six feet tall, had no chin, had bowed legs, straw-colored hair with two strands sticking straight up like antennas. He had no visible ears. He had slanted eyes. His skin coloring is the color of an oriental. The being had two arms, but no hands. The one arm came down and then nothing. The other arm had a cone-like device on the end of it. Whenever he pointed and waved the cone-shaped device, the item disappears. 
I don't know where it goes. You just can't see it anymore. He's dressed in black. It looks like what a scuba diver would wear. Now, I do think it's interesting that the descriptions of the creature in this book don't have any sort of, of, of symbols or markings on the, the outfit, even though the illustration that is produced as a result of the description and, um, and newspaper reports all talk about a, a six-pointed star on the belt buckle that the, uh, that the creature was wearing. So in addition to the hypnosis, there were other measures that Dr. Sprinkle took to try to determine how credible Carl might be. And uh, Marjorie describes that process this way. Psychological tests are given. Carl undergoes psychiatrist testing. Test results? He has no mental illness. I would like a little more um, insight into that, uh, but she also mentions Apro does a study of Carl, and this one intrigued me. Dr. He- quote, Dr. Hynek tried to debunk Carl's story, but in doing so, only gave it more validity, end quote. Um, how so? In what way? Uh, that would be uh, That would be nice. So as the story keeps going, um, they they have some interesting experiences. There, there's um, Carl has a few sort of acting out moments when he he sort of gets triggered and the what the memories get uh, get triggered. There is a sighting of a strange object. Uh, Carl sees it. Uh, actually, um, Carl and Marjorie uh, see it. It's a bright green light in the sky that looks like an upside down ice cream cone, and then. They were bombarded as they watched this with the smells of dirty, dirty socks and then sulfur. Uh, so it, it's sort of a strange encounter. But but throughout all this, Carl is still very concerned that that he is um, he's suffering some sort of breakdown, and it's very sort of depressing to him. But then he starts getting contacted by UFO people, and he enjoys these conversations and. Uh, he realized that he needs to talk about it. He can't keep it bottled up. And eventually he feels more confident and and improved and and he wants to go to work. And um, he's happy to tell his story. And that has helped him. And he still doesn't know. Uh, They've gone and take pictures of the muck hole where the truck ended up um, after his missing time period. They've taken pictures of everything that could be relevant. The place where uh, Carl believes that cubicle had set down that he was sort of trapped in. Strange carvings, that sort of thing. And he talks about in the book, or Marjorie talks about, in search of uh, coming to uh, coming to uh, in- investigate and doing a, doing a segment on it. They didn't get to the exact area because the camera crew supposedly refused to go to the actual area, the crew saying it was too eerie. In fact, there were a number of camera crews they talk about who said that um, it was just too strange and such a, an eerie feeling to go to that, uh, to that woods. And the story began to spread. And uh, Marjorie does highlight this extent to which the story circulated. His story is in Time Life. It is on database software and is in the UFO encyclopedia. You can go to the search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, etc. on the internet, type in Carl Higdon and get his story. The story of the incident is still on the internet after 43 years. Some of the stories are factual, and some are dramatized. His story is mentioned in movies and books that we are unaware of, unless someone sends a copy or calls us. Several times we have received calls to see if what someone has read or seen about Carl is true. We have not seen all the articles or movies. We cannot say if what they saw or heard is true. We can only say, yes, it did happen. I I love that. I love that. It is still on the internet and then in bold after 43 years. (sighs) 
I, yes, I mean, I'm not sure if it was on the internet 43 years ago, unless somebody on ARPANET was emailing somebody at, I don't know, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory about the Higdon case. Um, I'll allow it. Uh, 43 years on the internet, that's, uh, that's dynamite. It's in time life. You can look it up on the Bing or indeed the Google. Uh, they, um, they, they, they continue their life. They don't deny the story. They talk about it when asked. But uh, Carl has a a very uh, a very sort of philosophical outlook about this and some practical advice for his fellow experiencers. Maybe, maybe someday we will know why. Until then, Carl suggests, if this happens to you, Talk with someone you can trust. Do not dwell on it. And get on with your life. I think that's really good practical advice for somebody who's had an experience like this. Or really, gosh, almost almost anything. Talk to somebody you trust and get on with your life. That, that advice applies to just about a lot of crises that people might experience in their life. Um, in a little epilogue, uh, Marjorie gives uh, sort of an, an update of where the Higdons are in 2017. Carl is now in his 80s. He has macular degeneration of the eyes and has a heart condition. He is retired from the oil field and enjoying life. He and his wife have four kids and have been married for 59 years. Carl and Marjorie lost their oldest daughter, Rose, with cancer this year. Carl and Marjorie are grandparents and great-grandparents. Now, just from my own research, research, I I, I call it, because that sounds more impressive than I looked around on the internet, but uh, it appears that um, after a while in in Wyoming, uh, the Higdons moved back to Texas, where they were originally from. Um, and uh, and uh, Marjorie has a, as far as I can tell, a Facebook presence uh, from the things that were uh, available to be publicly viewed. I can say this, if you imagine the, um, the, the Facebook account of any random 80-year-old person you know, you're probably at least... 92% of the way to knowing what's what her Facebook page looks like. Sadly, uh, Carl passed away in January of 2022 um, of it, at the VA hospital in Temple, Texas of COVID pneumonia. Uh, he was um, born in 1935. So he was, he, he had a long, uh, a long life, um, but he, uh, he did, uh, he did pass away uh, just about, just about two years ago. Actually, what, depending on when you hear this, probably almost exactly two years ago. So what do we, what do we make of this book, uh, especially in light of the earlier and, and honestly, in, in, in some ways, more thorough coverage of his experience? Um, like I said earlier, I came to this story through this book, and I honestly don't remember wh- how I found the book it was some kind of, I think, it's Amazon ad, I, uh, targeted Amazon ad, which if that tells you anything about algorithms, good grief. The targeted Amazon ad sent me to an $8 self-published book about a UFO abduction. I mean, that's, that's pretty dead on. That's pretty terrifyingly accurate for my, uh, my predilections. So that's how I first read the story. And then when I looked at some of these, uh, these newspaper accounts, it, it, I was I was astonished that the book by the people who had experienced this, or at least at a very you know small remove, had experienced it. Their their account was in some ways way more bland than the newspaper reports, which is which is interesting, and it sort of leads me to think that maybe the first person narration or, or story that was attributed to Higdon in the star in 1977 might, might not have been entirely 
accurate. At first I thought he was just another hunter until my eyes became accustomed to the glare of the bright sunlight on the freshly fallen snow. That does not sound like our Wyoming coyote. Now, far be it from me to accuse the the star of playing fast and loose with a person's words, but it, it doesn't it doesn't sound like like Carl. It doesn't sound like the Carl we heard on In Search Of. It doesn't sound like the quotations we find in the book. Um, I, I think this is this is a book that. You would only, uh, I'm not sure how I want to say this. I don't, I, I don't want to sound snarky or condescending about this. This is the book that you get when even elderly people can find a way to pub, self publish a book very easily. Although I like to think that grandkids helped grandma out with this. But uh, what I mean by that is, Yes, it's it's a, in quotes, book that I bought at Amazon. But this is really more akin to what you would find as like those little pamphlets with stories that Gray Barker used to sell through Saucerian Press. Um, except, except that would be a book that was probably a lot like that Star article. Cleaned up, polished, made more commercial. I think this sort of raw accounting almost conversational style of presentation is no, not objectively good writing, but I think it works. I think it serves the purpose and um, whether by design or by luck, I, I think as I read it out loud, especially I found it to be very, um, very sort of evocative and affecting. So, Here's to Carl and uh, and Marjorie, who wrote his first person account, um, and uh, a, a great uh, a, a great story, um, just a, a great encounter and great resources that tell us about it. Thanks for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual channels, and uh, we'll be addressing those next time. Our associate producer is the indefatigable Simpson J. Hanover III. The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you.